Greetings, boys and babes. It's the Magic Hour, a place where we navigate through life's peaks and valleys with all the vulnerability and shamelessness we can muster. With the help of world-class guests from all walks of life, we uncover new truths and valuable tools for manifesting our highest potential. I'm your host, Mercedes Terrell, along with my partner in shine, Jade Bryce. Hey, you guys. Today's guest is doing some groundbreaking work to help integrate alternative practices into clinical settings. He's a really fascinating guy. He lived in the jungle for a whole year, studying and drinking plant medicine six days a week, and has worked with ayahuasca over the past eight years. He said there's life before plant medicine and life after plant medicine, and you guys know I couldn't agree more. He wrote the Concussion Repair Manual, as well as this book, as well. He wrote the concussion repair manual as well. And this book is a must read, not only for people with brain injuries, but for anyone wishing to enhance their cognitive abilities, conquer emotions and get the most out of life. I am so excited to have him on today. Yes, I am too. So without further ado, let me introduce a man who is one of the leading pioneers in plant medicine and transformational healing with a background in integrative psychiatry, neurocognitive restoration, peak performance medicine, and psychedelic research. He helps individuals shift from illness and trauma to health and happiness. His transdisciplinary approach focuses on healing the body and brain, the heart and mind, and finally integrates the spirit to help individuals optimize all aspects of health for sustained fulfillment. He lectures and consults globally and is the medical director of Revive Treatment Centers of America, as well as medical advisor to Onnit Labs, the True Rest Float Centers, and several international treatment centers using indigenous plant medicines for healing and recovery. Additionally, he has programs to help people get free from meds and practices full spectrum medicine, utilizing the most effective tools available today to improve mental health care and help and heal chronic suffering. His multidisciplinary approach focuses on helping people become whole, happy, and free. He is truly a student of life, and his newfound growth is experienced each and every time you hear him speak. He has said that coming to truth is not a comfortable path, but we're so thankful he chose it because the world is truly benefiting from his work as an ever unfolding human. Please welcome Dr. Dan Engel to the Magic Hour. <clears throat> Let's do that again. Yeah, that was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know what sucks? Laura McCohen, the one that canceled that Saturday, mm -hmm. she was in Austin when you were in Austin, but I didn't know. She had a signing oh up book people. Oh my gosh. I know. <clears throat> we should, by the way, when are we going to set up the ones that we've already... My neighbor went to it. Um, <clears throat> wrote for. I'll work on that today. It's okay, Laura, Glowmaven. The thing that sucks is they're all on the East Coast. Yeah. But if you're able to do it at 10 a.m. my time, I could get it in while the kids are in school. But their new school is only 9 to 12, Tuesdays, Thursdays. Okay. Night. Let's talk about it after because I'm recording still. Okay. Greetings, boys and babes. It's the Magic Hour, a place where we navigate through life's peaks and valleys with all the vulnerability and shamelessness we can muster. With the help of world-class guests from all walks of life, we uncover new truths and valuable tools for manifesting our highest potential. I'm your host, Mercedes Terrell, along with my partner in shine, Jade Bryce. Hey, you guys. Today's guest is doing some groundbreaking work to help integrate alternative practices into clinical settings. He's a really fascinating guy. He lived in the jungle for a whole year, studying and drinking plant medicine six days a week, and has worked with ayahuasca over the past eight years. He said there's life before plant medicine and life after plant medicine, and you guys know I couldn't agree more. He wrote the Concussion Repair Manual, as well, and this book is a must read not only for people with brain injuries, but for anyone wishing to enhance their cognitive abilities, conquer emotions, and get the most out of life. I'm so excited to have him on today. 
Yes, me too. So without further ado, let me introduce a man who is one of the leading pioneers in plant medicine and transformational healing. With a background in integrative psychiatry, neurocognitive restoration, peak performance medicine, and psychedelic research, he helps individuals shift from illness and trauma to health and happiness. His transdisciplinary approach focuses on healing the body and brain, the heart and mind, and finally integrates the spirit to help individuals optimize all aspects of health for sustained fulfillment. He lectures and consults globally and is the medical director of the Revive Treatment Centers of America, as well as medical advisor to Onnit Labs, the True Rest Float Centers, and several international treatment centers using indigenous plant medicines for healing and recovery. Additionally, he has programs to help people get free from meds and practices full spectrum medicine, utilizing the most effective tools available today to improve mental health care and heal chronic suffering. His multidisciplinary approach focuses on helping people become whole, happy, and free. He is truly a student of life, and his newfound growth is experienced each and every time you hear him speak. He has said that coming to truth is not a comfortable path but we're so thankful he chose it because the world is truly benefiting from his work as an ever unfolding human. Please help me welcome Dr. Dan Engel to the magic hour. Cool. <clears throat> Let me stop that. Hi, oh, let's see. Hello. Hi. Hi guys. Hi, how are you? I'm great. <clears throat> um, so are you guys okay if this is not video. Yep, we're aware. <laughs> yeah, if um, yeah, because it'll drop you off. You said right. Yeah, we've been having a hard time with uh, our uh, Wi-Fi here lately. I'm not sure if it's the local 5G server or what's been going on, but our video hmm. has always been intermittent. Uh, well, not always, but uh, in the last month, three out of the last four video podcasts have all been almost unusable. Wow. Intermittent click outs. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll just use um, like stock footage or an image of you when we make our little promos. Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, if that's good for you guys. That's great for me. Yeah. yeah. And we, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I don't know if you can see us on your side, but we like to record ours at least so that we have it for the promo as well. Yeah. You guys look awesome on my side. Oh, you see us. Okay. <laughs> um, we have uh, so much that we want to cover with you. So, um, so we'll just squeeze as much in as possible. And um, uh, cool. yeah. I talk fast and I like this stuff. I so noticed. I yeah. Get through a, a quite a bit of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Um, do, do you want to read his bio or just start it with the questions? Um, I think we should. Let's. Well. You know so much. We we usually, Dr. Dan, we usually read like a very extensive bio for our uh, guests and we put a lot of work into those, but because we want to get to so many questions with you and you probably know all this about yourself already, <laughs> I'm going to skip that and let's just get into questioning so that we don't, so we have enough time to do that with you. I know we have a Yeah. And you guys uh, feel free to record the intro or anything you want. Yeah. To yeah. We did. Yeah. 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 Okay. Awesome. All right, Mercedes, you got first question. Alrighty. So Dr. Dan, first of all, thank you so much for being here. We're so yeah. excited to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be with you both. And um, we, like we mentioned, we have a ton to cover with you, but before we get into all that, you have a really fascinating story. So maybe you can just pull some of the highs and lows that brought you to who you are today and give that to us and our listeners. Hmm. Well, that's a great question. Uh, so let me pick uh, three of the most uh, notable. I broke my neck two weeks before medical school, and wow. that got me into psychiatry and neurology. Went Because I was going to do surgery or ER medicine. I was really um, just focused on those uh, more interventional therapeutic domains. And after I broke my neck, I realized, wow, I don't know anything about neurology. It's, a it's the first time I've slowed down. And I realized I've just been standing on the gas pedal and really cruising through life and not really enjoying it very much. Mm -hmm. So I slowed down, became much more humanistic and just curious too about our minds and what make our minds so unique and start to work as this navigation system for life. And that got me into both of those arenas. I did my full training in psychiatry, 
uh, with residencies and fellowships and then opened up an integrative psych clinic. We were doing pretty good work, um, getting kids and adults off of medications, but it still wasn't the soul of it. Mm-hmm. And the second chapter in this uh, short little autobiography <laughs> was <laughs> me being introduced to ayahuasca in an underground circle about 14 years ago. Mm. And I learned more about myself in one weekend with ayahuasca than I had in one decade of psychotherapy. Wow. So I closed up my clinic, moved down to the jungle. Well, I lived in an ashram for two years before moving down to the jungle. And then I lived in the jungle for a year, uh, deep in the woods, no running water, no, no electricity, no other gringos, just mm. me and the plants, uh, studying with a couple of teachers. And that was transformative. A hundred percent. Really amazing. And it also, when I came back and moved back to the States, initiated initiated me into my dark night of the soul Mm. and uh, was in a year of a suicidal depression, lived in a tent on the backside of a friend's property um, because I didn't really appreciate how much integration is necessary for medicine. Mm. And I had been living at the pace of nature and at the speed of (laughs) birds and crickets for a year. So to come back into the fast paced society, the way that we live was just so grating on my nervous system. Eventually came back out and um, started to run a few other clinics, um, but it was kind of part-time, was still studying with ayahuasca, studied with Aya for about eight years and was pretty cruisy until third chapter, uh, my sister committed suicide. Mm. And that was a real powerful experience for me and my, and, and our whole family. And it brought me onto the stage, so to speak. I knew at that point I wasn't going to be um, doing my dharma if I was uh, not speaking on this work mm-hmm. and the importance of the right use of these psychedelic medicine technologies in the contemporary and modern day medical landscape. And what does it look like as a field of psychiatry starts to reclaim its essence as a soul-centered medicine and use these transformative tools for consciousness um, that are really powerful for a lot of the epidemics that we have right now. So that that's probably the the short and skinny auto bio uh, in three chapters right there. Yeah, thank you for that. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I I know that a lot of your background um, too comes from, like you said, you broke your neck and um, and you wrote your book um, about you know, overcoming traumatic brain injury and both Mercedes and I come from an MMA background. It's how we know each other. So we have a heavy, heavy MMA following, um, which, you know, concussions are a very common thing in the cage. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Can you tell us about traumatic brain injury and how many, how like so many people are unknowingly suffering from this without even knowing about it? Yeah, it's true. Most people who have post-concussive syndrome don't know it. Mm-hmm. And most times, people have concussions, they do spontaneously heal because our Mm -hmm. our brains and our bodies are built as surviving, adaptable self-healing machines. When it doesn't heal, there's usually some other confounding variable like gut inflammation, Mm -hmm. hormonal dysregulation, uh, immune system dysfunction. If any one or all three of those are off, the nervous system is going to have a real hard time healing on its own. And with combat athletes, it's super helpful to have baseline diagnostics to just know how your brain is already functioning. Mm Because in combat sports, it's not a matter of if you're going to get hit, but when you're going to get hit, how hard you're going to get hit, maybe Mm -hmm. even how many times you're going to get hit, and if you're going to recover fully. Mm -hmm. So if you have baseline diagnostics, and that could be doing a – quantified EEG or QEEG brain map. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can get those through some neurofeedback uh, technicians and technologists. Um, You can do more sophisticated tests like balance and postureography, video nystagmography. These are just different ways to test the the health of the nervous system Mm -hmm. or even baseline cognitive function. How fast do you read? Do you recall? Do you shift sets from one task to another? How Mm -hmm. quick Can you um, uh, put short-term memory into long-term memory? How's your focus and concentration? If you know those baseline cognitive measures, and there are a variety of different practitioners, local, that can do these kind of tests, this would be kind of described as neuropsychiatric testing or neuropsychological testing. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. um, as well as cognitive performance testing. If you have baseline, now we have data to compare it to. So when you get hit, if you don't heal, and I can look at your baseline diagnostics, and I can look at your brain real time or your nervous system's function real time now, now I have a better idea where the primary deficit is. And if I know where the primary deficit is, now I have a better idea of how to treat it. Mm -hmm. So that's just a general approach to doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as people with post-concussive syndrome or after you get smashed, it's really important to take your own um, first person perspective responsibility choice to not get hit again too soon. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't wait for your trainer to, to tell you to stay out or your coach to tell you to stay out because they don't know what you're feeling. Right. And it really mm -hmm. sucks when your brain's off and you mm -hmm. can't think straight and you wake up with chronic headaches and you, you have, because I've had six pretty bad concussions and that's why I wrote the book is there was no treatment manual out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my post concussive syndrome looked like mood, dis mood dysregulation, hypersomnolence, I actually developed narcolepsy, uh, chronic myarian headaches, um, ha I had worsening time. This is my medical training too. I had worsening time putting short-term memory into long-term memory. So everything I was learning in didactics in the clinic, I couldn't retain. Mm -hmm. And it was just super frustrating. And so it's important to give yourself the time and space to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, be out of combat for another four to six weeks minimum while you're healing. Mm -hmm. And what things help healing? Well, first of all, <laughs> do the obvious. Don't get another head injury mm -hmm. while you're healing from the first one. Um, start taking CBD and fish oil. Start a low sugar diet. Stop alcohol. Uh, start mm -hmm. cleaning up anything that would be causing inflammation. Um, be mindful of how you share your energy. And if you have light noise sensitivity, which I had, uh, you may not want to be on screens for longer than 30 to 45 minutes at a time, or mm -hmm. definitely not after the sun goes down. Yeah. So all of these things help to ensure that sleep regulation is going to be ideal, that you are decreasing the, the, the brain's inflammatory load and that you're not stressing your system too much like retraining even if you're retraining hard and you're not getting hit but if your brain hasn't healed then you're essentially taking energy away from the healing mechanisms and you're diverting that energy for healing into further training mm -hmm. and that's when people can push themselves over what's called their metabolic threshold and have a re-experiencing of their symptoms even if they didn't get hit yeah. What about um, like the dangers of micro concussions on roller coasters and things like that? Do those, are those cause for concern? Those, those have a stackable effect for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really small and typically spontaneously heal. And it's, it's if you have an occupational hazard, because not, not many people are going to be riding roller coasters mm -hmm. repeatedly, like, you know, for days at a time or months at a time. Um, but occupational injuries are repeated exposures mm. to micro traumas. And that could be somebody who's firing uh, an automatic weapon or a rifle on a regular basis. That's a concuss that's a concussive blow directly to the side of the head. That's mm. why there's a limit to the number of recommended rounds fired per a given caliber. Mm. Um, and, and there's oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and that's just a, a one example of a bunch of different occupational hazards. So if somebody is in repeated exposure, even if it feels like not much is happening, it's important to at least be protective and take as many neuroprotectants as possible. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily need neuroreparatives if they don't have a full-blown head injury or concussion, but neuroprotectants are really helpful. Mm -hmm. And that would be things like, CBD, fish oil, antioxidants like selenium, CoQ10, mm -hmm. alpha lipoic acid. There's a bunch of different supplements to be able to take to essentially protect the neurons and, and their ability to buffer external intense uh, environmental loads. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something everyone should be taking just as a preventative measure to keep their brain healthy? 
I think it's, uh, well, we can answer that in a couple of different directions. If you want to take a minimalist approach, then uh, use it if there's a high suspicion mm. or if there's a high likelihood for susceptibility. So, for example, three out of four of my grandparents died with neurodegenerative conditions. Mm -hmm. Both my mom's parents died with Alzheimer's. My dad's dad died with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And those are just horrific ways to exit yeah. this mm -hmm. one monkey suit. And after seeing them go through neurodegenerative conditions and stacking my head injuries on top, mm -hmm. which predispose you for neurodegeneration, I hedged all my bats. And, and I take pretty consistently both neuro, neuroprotectants and neuroreparatives because I'm still snowboarding. I'm still doing stuff that, yeah. you know, my partner or my mom or people that are close to me would say, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. There's a mm -hmm. lot on the line. And yeah, well, we're still, um, I, I'm not going to, uh, not live your life. Exactly. I'm not going to prevent mm -hmm. myself from doing the things I really love and enjoy. Yeah. So if there's a high likelihood, if there's a past experience of trauma and a high likelihood for more trauma or potential for neurodegeneration, mm -hmm. then I say for sure, because mm -hmm. everybody does pretty well with fish oil. Mm -hmm. And there's a yeah. good, there's a good case to be made that uh, eating um, seafood is what helped us <clears throat> develop into the magnificent brains that we have today. That mm -hmm. and maybe microdosing psilocybin. Yeah. yeah. And you also talk a lot about stress and how that affects the brain. Is this, um, is that as, awful on the brain as concussions? Uh, yes, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, stress is one of those ubiquitous experiences in our current human condition. Yeah. Everybody lives to a degree of stress in our given society, whether it's external stress because we're trying to keep up with the pace of our technology mm -hmm. while our nervous systems have really evolved at the pace of nature. It's only in the last hundred years that we tried to keep up with the speed of our technology. Mm -hmm. That's a stress for yeah. sure. Externally, internally, there's the constant <laughs> stress that tells that the, our mother culture tells us that we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. that We need to buy the next widget, fancy this, fancy that to be cool, to be successful. Um, our whole capitalistic orientation is built on find people's primary pain point, push it, and then sell them the remedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it starts early. You know, when, when we were oftentimes raised by parents who were only just trying to do the best that they know how to do, mm -hmm. and oftentimes got um, satisfaction or value of their own parenthood at the success of their children. So mm -hmm. kids are start, kids early on are rewarded for how well they do, not just for who they are. Yeah. So that's already an externally based level of self-validation. So there's mm -hmm. all these stressors and stress is the number one cause of chronic disease. We know that. And the number one cause of stress is time urgency. And that's yeah. only it worse. I feel like I get stuck in that. Like um, the other day I got pulled over for speeding and the cop asked, why are you in such a hurry? And I, I literally was like, I don't know. I'm, I'm early because I've been, I've been in a hurry all day. So I'm actually early to where I'm going. I have no idea why I'm in this constant sense of having this constant sense of urgency. Um, mm, so that's something that's I'm definitely working example. on. It just gets normalized, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and if you see the rest of the lemmings running off the cliff and you stop, right. then they're going to be like, what are you doing? What are you stopping for? Let's go. It's, you know, the, the, the goal is this way. Right. Stopping mm -hmm. against the herd is an active process and mm. it can feel strange because you're not doing what everybody else is doing. Yeah. But the definition of normal and the definition of health today are not the same. What's mm. normalized now is not healthy. Absolutely. Of the way yeah. the people, but because of the way we all live. And yeah. so it's really helpful. That's why meditation is an active process. It takes a lot of discipline to just sit down and slow things down. It really is. It's some, I mean, it seems like such a popular thing now, but even so, you know, the majority of my friend group that I grew up with are still having issues around sitting down and being silent. And I have issues myself of getting myself to do that on a regular basis because I get all caught up in the glorification of busy. Um, but that does lead me to my next question, which is what are the methods of healing the human that you special specialize in specifically? Healing the human, like the whole human experience. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, awesome question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that question that directly. <laughs> hmm. Brilliant. Uh, when I think of being human and this human experience, I think of it as a multi-leveled process, right? We are physical. We have a body, a mind, a heart, a soul, and a spirit, or at mm. least a spiritual connection. So I think of it on all five levels. And what we are reclaiming through the field of psychiatry in this new modern era on this eve of transformational medicine is a soul-centered approach. Like at the core of our being, we all have a soul, but most people don't even know what that means or it's a mm -hmm. little nebulous and a little effuse. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to be connected to a soulful experience of living, which means that we, we do appreciate the beauty and the privilege that it is to be human, that we do appreciate everybody else's beauty and intelligence and genius and importance. All life is sacred. All people are as important. There's no more important person. Right. And there's never been another you and there will never be another you. And so what is it that you're here to do? The song that you're here to sing, the genius that you're here to launch. And we can also start to come into more experience of reverence and, and deep connection. If we appreciate that every body is living the same kind of human experience, just in a different way, we're all leaves falling from the same tree. Mm. So at, at the core of our being, I think it's helpful and important to be able to start to orient a conversation around the connection with soul and also a connection with the stories that we choose to tell ourselves mm -hmm. about life. What stories have we told ourselves up to this point about different aspects of our life, about our relationships, about where we live, where we came from, who we are, what we're here to do. Do we feel good enough about who we are? Do we feel like we need to keep proving ourselves? Or that if we're not just perfect in the way that we project ourselves, then we're not going to get the love that we want and everybody deserves. So we can start to consciously create the narrative for which we choose to live. And the majority of the people in the stories that are most compelling are those that go on the heroes and the heroines journey. Hmm. And they get called to action. And they go through a trial of challenges and into the dark night and they pop out the other side, oftentimes scuffed up and bruised up, but, but wiser for it, stronger for it, more resilient for it, and here to give their service back to the collective. So as we start to bring in these core components of what it is to be human, then we notice too that the other things in our lives start to fall into place. Our body starts to spontaneously heal from chronic disease once we find meaning purpose and value in our lives and in our expression mm -hmm. and to come back to a heart-centered experience of community and our relationships and knowing that we're born to bond and that's one of our primary drives and if we're not expressing our primary drives then it's going to come out as some distortion or a blockage and so when we know that these drives include freedom of expression freedom of love being able to serve, feeling safe and secure in our relationships, and the drive to transcend and have transcendent experiences, ecstatic states. Mm -hmm. All of these include the, the, the different facets of what it is to be in this tapestry of a human experience. And mm -hmm. all of them are important. And sometimes we express some of them, but most of us don't express most of them. And when we do that more effectively, I've seen consistently that all of the things that we want to track in the biohacking arena start to get better. Hormones start to improve. Some of this is like flow data and flow states and Kotler and Wheels um, conversation in um, The Rise of Superman and um, Stealing Fire. And that and flow states is just one perspective of that. Mm -hmm. It's also about how we serve community how we find meaning and value in our contribution and, the, and, and giving back in a way that mm. leaves the world better than when we found it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, to me is just speaks to the same recycled um, ideas that each religion even seems to have used. And it's, and I don't know 
if this is going to, well, you're so articulate, Dr. Dan, it's hard to even <laughs> add know. anything to what you have to say here. And I'm not really trying to add, but I'm just trying to note, I guess, that we as a species and a culture especially seem to be um, having an issue with getting in touch with our soul. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of pushback, you know, and I have experienced that in my own life. I have done that in my own life. Um, I still find myself doing that. And so when I get to hear someone like you speak on that so articulately, it cuts mm -hmm. straight to my core. It's kind of hard to, uh, it's kind of hard to continue to live in that lie, you know? Yeah. And it sounds so simple when you say it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you for doing the work that it took to get you to the place you are now yeah. and, and able to speak on it the way you do. Um, so for you, is there sp specific, uh, maybe, uh, modalities that you could offer to us and our listeners that would be great ways um, we'll get into plant medicine, of course, during this talk, but maybe things that are not using psychedelics um, that people could use to get there, to access, like, you know, their soul yeah. and their truth. Like mm -hmm. float tanks, I know you speak a lot about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, happy to get into that. Maybe we can describe those as technologies and experiences. Because uh, kind of like Stan Groff said, once a while back, who's like the, a heavy in the whole field of plant medicine research and psychedelic therapy. Um, what we're lacking in our uh, current cultural landscape is an experiential spirituality, mm. an experience of spirit. And Mercedes, you were describing this um, like recycled, um, <laughs> more modern language around similar themes that most mm -hmm. spiritual traditions speak about. And you're right. Mm -hmm. There's a really good book called Oneness by, uh, funny enough, a guy by the last name of Moses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he just did a discourse in looking at the world's primary spiritual traditions and quote unquote religions and how all of them speak about pretty much the same things. And so this is what it is to be human. This is at the core of our being. And it is fairly simple. It's not easy because in our culture, we just live such fast paced lives and so externally oriented. And we're not taught these kind of things as children frequently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our parents were um, doing the best they knew how to do. Our grandparents came out of the second world war. Uh, you know, it's only pretty recent that we've had so much modern luxury on a global scale. Mm. And the shadow side of that is now we have these diseases of affluence where it's easy to just sit around being a couch potato all day and mm -hmm. hit one button purchases on Amazon and numb out to the fear-based media. Mm -hmm. So there is an active process of deprogramming mm -hmm. and recentering that's necessary. And Jade, you mentioned flotation tanks and mm -hmm. I, probably that's, that's probably my most favorite current technology Yeah, outside of plant medicines because everybody can float doesn't matter how old you are, young you are, on medications, not on medications, healthy, not healthy, everybody can float. The only time people have said, I can't float is when they have claustrophobia and don't right. like being in close spaces. And I said, that's an even better time to <laughs> float. Yeah. I know some people don't like it because when they get in there, they feel like they see a bunch of dark images um, yeah. coming at them. So it's yeah, that another be. reason to really want to need to do it. Yeah. Uh, that can be another fear-based experience um, that's really a doorway into self-discovery. Mm -hmm. Like what are all of those images that are just percolating in the background that mm -hmm. are only now on the screen of my awareness because I've slowed down and I've disconnected from the environment enough to allow that mm -hmm. to come forth. Right well, let me allow that to come forth because I don't want to just walk around numb to that or right. actually not there because it's going to shape yeah. how I experience life. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if sometimes because it's, it's the closest it can be to being in our mother's womb, if, um, you know, I know we feel emotions in our mother's womb, like maybe it somehow takes us back there if we didn't have a positive experience. I'm curious. I think, you're right on, I think you're right on with that. And a lot of uh, float researchers would even say the same thing. Mm. It is the first time since we were born 
that we're without sensory experience. Mm -hmm. we, we had even more sensory experience when we were in the womb. Mm. Because in the womb, we could feel proprioception and mom moving around. Hear noises. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, we had auditory input. And so, but it's the same kind of experience. We're in a dark, mm -hmm. held, protected womb mm -hmm. space that we're buoyant in. And we start to, because the water temperature is the same temperature as your skin, we start to lose even the familiarity with where we mm -hmm. stop and the rest of the world begins. Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy to now have a greater connection to perhaps this place that we all come from before we're in a body mm. and where we're going to go to once we exit a body. Yeah. I think that the fear oh. though, too, comes from that same idea of yeah. not knowing where you end. Not having yeah, no boundaries of um, where you end and the rest of the world begins in a sense. Right. It's almost triggers you to feel like that, that ego story of, do I mm -hmm. exist? Do I exist? You know, always needing to be validated and reaffirmed in that knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for me, when my very first float tank, the most frightening thing for me was being in such darkness um, and stillness. Mm -hmm. And I, I've had this reoccurring dream I've talked about on the show before, but where I'm standing there in, you know, like an, on an old, uh, property I used to live in with my grandparents. It was a farm. So it was very dark at night. Didn't have any other external lights really going on, but there was this one bug zapper light that shone on the group of our family, um, me and some, you know, people that were really close to me. And every time I would blink, one would disappear into the darkness and each. So obviously I was there eventually left alone and I had to choose to, to walk into the darkness or not. And I, I chose to, but, um, that for me, the float tank was very triggering in that same sense of that mm -hmm. fear that comes with the darkness. Cause that's the chaos yeah. that we haven't confronted yet in ourselves. I, for some reason thought I was going to die the first time I did it. Mm -hmm. Like when I was in there, I thought I could possibly die in here. Like, I don't know why I, this fear of death came over me. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but, but what has been your number one benefit? The They're both things. really powerful. Each of those experiences is about being okay in mm -hmm. the unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay with the, the experience of disconnection and darkness. Mm -hmm. And then to find our ability to self-regulate in that. Yeah. To come back to our breath, to slow things down, to find an experience of connection that we hold in our own mind's eye that that is the thread of our own hum, human experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it's this sleeping dream time that you're that that's easy to morph in and out of and if i can state one or two of the primary benefits to your question jade mm -hmm. is the ability to support people in the growing experience of being okay in the unknown mm -hmm. and becoming more comfortable in the discomfort because it starts to build resilience in mm. the mind. Mm -hmm. And then we start to look less outward for our own ability to resource, mm -hmm. resource our worth, resource our love, resource our own personal meaning. And, and it grows this ability to connect within. And, and to be honest with you too, these are a lot of, you know, fancy words that I've noodled on this for a long time. So I, I, that's mm -hmm. why I can speak on it, you know, fairly off the cuff. Um, but that's also to say a lot happens in the tank that we don't even know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Just like in the medicine experience, there's a reason that medicine experiences are called ineffable, which yeah. means it's hard to put into words. <coughs> and what we do know is that the more people float, it tends to create greater and greater relaxation. Now that that's physical, physiologically, because we can see yes, stress hormones get mm -hmm. normalized, blood pressure normalizes. Forces you to unplug. Forces you to unplug for sure, which is like meditation on steroids. Yeah. And so it has this stacking benefit. And what's happening psychologically and and soulfully, I think we're we're still starting to uncover and, and put understanding towards. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, I love that that's, a, you know, the magic trick you're leaving with our 
listeners yeah. maybe too, because it's such a simple thing to just walk into a float um, tank facility and, and spend 90 minutes doing that and see how, how it goes for you your first yeah. time. If you haven't already. Yeah, Mercedes, I love your backdrop too, by the way. <laughs> I think the float uh, thank you. <laughs> a lot of people say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you also speak on something called the uh, Satori method. Could you explain mm -hmm. that for us a bit? Yes. Uh, Satori is a Zen Buddhist term for sudden awakening. And there are practices that we can engage that will give us a sudden awakening experience. And sometimes that happens spontaneously. And, and if it does happen spontaneously and there's no referenced for it it can feel really de destabilizing mm -hmm. sounds like, like a funny. kundalini awakening Same exactly way. another great example mm -hmm. and uh one of my primary teachers ran something called the kundalini crisis clinic mm -hmm. <laughs> which was a wow. clinic for people going through spontaneously yeah. kundalini uh, opening experiences they, they they couldn't manage and they thought mm -hmm. they were going crazy yeah i get wow. it wow and, and it's unfortunate that we don't have a better understanding for that because I've had many clients that were um, unfortunately stuck in psychiatric institutions and put on medications because they had an expression of a kundalini opening and awakening mm -hmm. that they didn't know what it was. Sometimes their body moves in certain positions. We would call those mudras, or they may hear something that other people don't hear or have visual experiences that other people don't. And, and those are, by the way, all the classic symptoms of schizophrenia, <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. according to modern psychiatry. Um, so it, it's helpful to have a framework to engage people in the preparation process. So if we're going to engage Satori methods, mm -hmm. it's really important to be able to onboard people with the understanding of what could happen and then to help them integrate it on the other side. So it's a three-phase approach, preparation, experience, and integration. Now, classically and historically, Satori experiences were accessed through a variety of different wisdom teachings and traditions, like the practices of certain yogic um, postures, breathwork practices, and meditation styles. That's one lineage and one particular orientation. Other experiences of awakening could be in isolation in nature. And that would be described by certain traditions as a vision quest or in the Lakota language, a hambleche. Um, those are experiences of typically inward focus or outward communion with something outside of the usual ego, right? So I'm either going deep into myself, mm -hmm. below the ego, subconscious, or I'm going outward and to commune with something outside of my little me, mine, and I, and to remember where I come from and to commune with the divine, outward, super conscious. So we have these two different directions. We can go subconscious and get in the material. We can go super conscious and get in the material. And a Satori experience tends to be uh, similar to that process of metamorphosis when the caterpillar turns into a butterfly mm -hmm. and the caterpillar doesn't have any idea what's going to be to, but to be a butterfly. <laughs> so if it spontaneously happens, it might freak out like, Whoa, where'd the wings come from? Who am I? And all my caterpillar friends now are going to look at me like what just happened to you. Right. And so we have this tendency to project our experience onto others and make them right or wrong based in our own idea of what's normal. And if we can introduce these kinds of practices, and we just mentioned a couple, mm -hmm. there's also holotropic breath work or a style of pranayama where you can get in elevated states just through breath. There's also fasting and going without food, particularly toxic food in order to clean up the internal system and draw energy up through the crown to open into the mind. Mm. And um, blindfolded trance dance, um, is another historical method. It doesn't have to be blindfolded, but when you do blindfold, then you go even deeper in. And when you start to dance or move at, at a high BPM or beats per minute above 140 or 160, you start to get into elevated states. So mm -hmm. these are just a few practices of what can 
stimulate something called a satori experience Mm -hmm. and then the the magic happens really on the other side of that which is how do we integrate that peak experience and make that usable for our daily walk Mm -hmm. and bring that treasure so to speak back to the collective like the hero and the heroine do on the other side of their journey right Mm -hmm. where's a good place to find out more about that method um i've given a bit of its description and some of the preliminary um nomen like the nomenclature or the language around it as well as a schematic for it on full spectrum medicine okay uh that's our education advocacy platform for these kinds of awakening experiences Mm -hmm. and it's also part of the curriculum that we're designing for the center that we're opening in austin this summer called kuya oh wow that's where i live so that's exciting Excellent. Yeah. Good. So you're, um, uh, you're an Austin local. Yeah, I actually almost ate Thanksgiving dinner with you at the Kingsbury's, but I ended up leaving town. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been fun. That would have yeah. been a awesome way to meet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Well, then you're going to understand what we're up to. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, I'd like to also discuss the loneliness epidemic with you that the majority of people are experiencing. Mm-hmm. Well, I love how informed y'all's questions are. Good, good <laughs> job on the homework. Um, yeah, it's phenomenal when we look at the five primary, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, but mm-hmm. the five primary obvious psychiatric epidemics of our time right now, mm-hmm. depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, and pain, mm-hmm. and both chronic physical pain and emotional psychic soul level pain. All of these, particularly the obvious PTSD, depression, anxiety, addiction, all of those are going through epidemic proportions, even with the fancy advent of all of our psychopharmacology, all of our pharmaceuticals. And it may very well be that at the core, or at least a common thread between all of those is loneliness Mm -hmm. and an experience of disconnection. Because we know that we're born to bond. That's a part of being human. We are social creatures. We do better in secure, safe, expressed, joyful relationships than in isolation as a whole. Yes, there are some rishis and sages and, um, and, and enlightened beings, so to speak, that do their work in isolation, meditating on peace, on welfare, on love, and essentially anchor a pillar for that frequency into the collective consciousness so that there's somebody in isolation doing that because it the hardest work is to do like your enlightening work in the day-to-day mm-hmm. like in in downtown urban jungles it's a bit easier to stay in the zone so to speak tucked away in a cave kind of like it was for me tucked away in a hut when i was living mm-hmm. in the jungle the work is really to do it yeah. in the day-to-day right. and so when we do connect with one another and we lift each other up in conscious community and we share the experiences of being human and we start to re-inhabit the village, so to speak, which is a term that I enjoy. Um, mm-hmm. I forgot the name of uh, the woman that wrote that. She wrote a really good book called Re-Inhabiting the Village. And it's all these different experiences mm-hmm. of being a human in village life. And what does it mean to have a, like a modern village? It means that you're around people that you can count on. And most intact cultures have a community-based experience of living. Mm -hmm. We in our modern society tend to be pretty isolated with this frontier mentality that we have to do it all all on our own, and then we have to own everything so as to be independent as possible. Mm -hmm. And, And we don't know most of our neighbors because it's easy to just hit the garage door button open drive in and close and like oh yeah i saw my neighbor today driving by into the garage um we just don't tend to have as much social connection and communion as our ancestors where we come from and as a part of our like human blueprint had and expressed Mm -hmm. so all of that is just to say that when when we get connected to people that we have like-minded, like-hearted, like-spirited experiences of living with, we tend to live more joyful, better lives. And the longest study that we've ever done, which is an 80-year Harvard study, 
showed that the best measure for longevity Mm -hmm. wasn't genetics, wasn't exercise, wasn't diet, wasn't how much you sleep, wasn't like all these biohacking metrics that we can track. Mm -hmm. It was the quality of a person's relationship. Yeah. Do you think that um, the amount of screen time that kids are now having, that that's just kind of making this even a more downward spiral in our future of, of those five conditions that you spoke on? 100%. Yeah. And it is true that we can connect more virtually than we've ever been able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that's been at the detriment of our physical connection and our soulful connection. Mm -hmm. And if I have 5,000 superficial friends on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, but I don't really have, you know, half a dozen really good friends, that's the opposite of the way it used to be. What it used to be is like, oh yeah, there were five, six, so like really tight people. Those are my homies. Those are people I could count on. And maybe I had a whole bunch of other uh, acquaintances. Mm-hmm. So we've kind of flipped the number. And mm-hmm. and and their virtual touch will never substitute human touch and physical touch. Yeah, it just can't. I I notice too in my own life. It's a matter of, or the way I would describe it is I. I'm seeking sometimes validation over connection. So Mm. you can get validation from, you know, the screen time. Um, You can get validation from, you know, your gaming buddies on your headset or through social media um, likes and such, but it's not true connection. It's Mm -hmm. at the back of our mind. We know that that little endorphin hit we're getting isn't sustainable and isn't real and it isn't the thing that we want most which is you know that real person to person connection soul connection yeah yeah i I haven't ever heard anybody describe it that way but i really like that summary statement yeah i do believe most of us are using our electronic technological social media based platforms as a means of validation and not well, it is a style of connection, but the end point right. is validation. And when we're usually together with people that we really jam with and really connected with, that's communion. Yeah. Right. We're, we're deeply connect, connecting in community to an experience of union. Yeah. yeah. True, deep presence with one another. Yeah. Union is really the right word because that, yeah. after all, like even in order to procreate, we need to create those type of connections that type of unity that type of union so that we can mm. move this species forward hopefully onward and upward <laughs> and um kim john Payne from simplicity parenting he talks about how the average amount of um, screen time kids are having right now that by the age of 18 it would equal up to sixty thousand hours Whoa. and he's like the saddest part of that is that that's sixty thousand hours that they may have spent connecting to their siblings or to their parents or to playing outside on a tree you know and um how how that's 60,000 hours of just staring into a screen and instead that's a lot of time. Yeah. It's, it, you don't think about it, you know, day to day or week to week. And then when you, yeah, think about the, it's, that's a massive amount span of, of it. Yeah. And, and I mean, geez, it's gotta be hard to be a kid. Uh, you know, kids don't necessarily know that it's hard to yeah. be right. different because they're just doing what they <laughs> do. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm not a parent. And, and I feel for parents having to navigate the, the balance between what's the right amount of screen time and, but you don't want them to grow up completely technologically ignorant either. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, I, I just get fascinated about where we're heading as a species. Me mm-hmm. too. It's sometimes it feels inevit- inevitable that we're just, you know, going to become these robots. We're going to become the thing we stare oh. into all day long. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it's no, because there's people like there's people having these conversations is what gives me hope because then it means yeah, there'll be absolutely. the awakening as well. Yeah, and this is a good example. Part of the the light side of our technology is the ability to share this much information. Yeah, right. That, that we've never been able to share something like a, a Maasai warrior in Sub-Saharan Africa has as much information in the palm of his hand as the president did 15 years ago. That's amazing. That's Mm. a fairly short period of time. And so it's enabled people to become more independent, to Mm. to actually bring also information from the shadows into the light, like the whole Me Too movement built Mm -hmm. on that. And the fact that we 
we are requiring more and more transparency from our elected leaders and and ideally more and more transparency and freedom in the information that we receive so that there's not somebody managing our google media searches and telling us what outlets we can or can't watch yeah it's it's such a interesting time is all I guess I can say about it because there's so much and and that's what we talk about on the show is that everything in our lives in our minds comes through contrast and it's a matter Mm -hmm. of figuring out how to how to float somewhere in the middle there and continue to have balance Mm -hmm. so what does it mean to have physical and psychic integrity in our modern world Dr. Dan wow another awesome question (laughs) good we may have to extend our, or have a part two to all of this. I know it. <laughs> um, so let me take those separately and then we'll weave those together. So physical integrity. Um, it, these are based on the building blocks of what it means to be human and to feed this monkey suit to the best of our ability with um, the greatest chance for success and longevity. And like you said, procreation. Mm-hmm. Right, so that's that's ensuring the the continuation of our species. Integrity in our daily practices of what are the building blocks of life. This means movement, breath, nutrition, light, electromagnetics. All life is built on the same building blocks. When we know how to access those fundamentals, and we do that on a regular basis into the sweet spot then we start to up level our physiology. And what I mean by a sweet spot is everything has, all medicine has its sweet spot. If you don't use enough, there's no effect. If you use too much, it's poison. Sunlight's like that, right? Uh, if I go lay out in the sun and, and, <laughs> and I'm not used to that and I just go out and get an eight hour sun bath, I'm probably gonna get fried. Or water's like that. If I drink a gallon of water at one sitting in like, five to 10 minutes, I'm going to get hypernatremic. I can have a seizure and die. It's actually one of the quickest ways um, that you could just do something natural that would be toxic. And wow. um, same thing with food. If we eat too much, which many people in our culture do, it's detrimental. Same in the opposite direction. So all of these basic fundamentals build the integrity structure and movement breaks down into a variety of different things too. Coordination, balance, speed, flexibility, strength, i.e. power. They're not totally synonymous, but for, for our purposes, we use those. Um, and breath work is the same. We talked about that in relationship to meditation. It can go in either direction. Breath is the cons- breath is the only conscious um, physiologic practice that we have that, that thankfully is also subconscious. Like we don't have to think to breathe. Otherwise, we'd have to think about all of our <laughs> inhales and exhales, and that yeah. wouldn't last very long. And we can toggle our nervous system into either direction. Sympathetic, awake, ready, ready for action, so to speak, or parasympathetic, rest, digest, assimilate. And breath will put us in either of those directions. Most people are stressed, so we can use our breath to relax. And that's one of the best, easiest, quickest practices. There's a practice I call four minutes to freedom, where if you do an inhale to four count and an exhale to eight count exhale while you're humming then it's about a six or so breath cadence per minute Mm. and if you do that over four minutes that's 24 slow breaths so it's inhale and then exhale with a hum to eight count that's actually one of the most effective practices for people with post-concussive syndrome to start re-regulating their nervous system and have a decrease in inflammation and stress. I could see mm. it. Anxiety too, I bet. Yeah. So, and it, it's good for so many anxiety. Calm me down just listening to you do it. <laughs> <laughs> try, try it. Just give yourself a week, do it for four minutes a day, commit to it and see how it fe- affects your day. I've noticed that if I'm already in a really kind of mellow state and I do that, then I'm even more mellow and I might not be like ready to have a podcast Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it has a physiologic effect. Mm. Um, So all of those I see as physical integrity practices and the integrate. And if, if we just look at the term integrity and and Mm -hmm. integrity means to me, integration, 
Mm. integration of all different aspects of ourself or all practices that are engaging health and optimization in a particular area of ourselves. So body, psychic, like and psychic integration. I think of integrating all different parts of our psyche and all different aspects of what we would describe as ourself. And some of that includes the things that we're really proud of and we want to put on social media and Instagram and Facebook profiles and selfie sticks, mm -hmm. but also our shadow material, the things that we have shame or guilt right. and around and don't want to show people. They're not our most um, joyful expressions or the things that we want to keep in the closet, mm -hmm. even our traumas. What, what's a part of us that maybe has been locked away as a result of a traumatic experience that we're not connected to? And how is that disconnection limiting us from being our, our full spectrum human, yeah. our most whole awake in service human. And so if we have practices where we can regain and reclaim these disconnected parts of ourself, establish more psychic integrity. And in my experience, we do become a more full experience of what our potential is. And I'll just leave with this one quote uh, in a book I read recently. Uh, Christ is the name of the single unified being who is expressed as the totality of human consciousness. Hmm. Hmm. So, wow. That's a, that's a name that I've never heard. And Jesus was a Christed being. He was an enlightened being. And there are other enlightened people as well. And what does it mean to be the fullest expression of the totality of human consciousness, which means a whole human right with psychic integrity hmm. and it's a remembering isn't it it's all a remembering a hundred percent yeah if we use jesus as another analogy he said all these things i do you can do and more hmm. which means we're all remembering our divinity we're all remembering our glory our amazingness like this body is a freaking amazing super machine right mm -hmm. this mind and brain is an amazing supercomputer it's a it's fucking incredible to be a human in a human body. Just the, all the factors <laughs> that go into creating life and sustaining life is magnificent beyond awareness. Yeah. And when we can come into those experiences of, of remembering, and if we bring it back to Satori, so much of what I think a Satori experience is, is our actual remembering of our divinity mm -hmm. and our grace. Yeah. I love that, Dr. Dan. So we have <clears throat> a couple more questions, and we also have a bunch of questions from the Magic Mob. Would you rather me schedule a part two um, with your assistant so that we can get those done, or would you rather us try to ask a few real quick? Um, I suspect that we've got enough uh, juice here for a part two. <laughs> yeah, we do. We definitely yeah, do. Just, just a hunch. Yeah. So if we have enough... Uh, for a part two, then uh, we'll leave this as the intro and we'll mm -hmm. pick up with part two. And I want to make sure that I can serve you guys uh, to the best of my ability and answer all your questions and, and um, yeah. giving some of the, the more personal questions, um, just a little bit of airtime sometimes leaves them a bit short and not, not really yeah. answered. Yeah. We had like six come through from our listeners. So there's, that's, that's probably um, uh, an episode a little in bit itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we, we really wanted to talk psychedelics with you as well. And that was our last question. So, um, so this is right at an hour. So this would be a good part one. Um, and then I could get with your assistant and figure out a time for part two. That sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And maybe next time we'll be able to have video time too. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank, what city are you in Dr. Dan? I'm in Boulder. Oh, you're in oh, Boulder. Awesome. My best friend, Tom lives in Boulder. Mm. Uh, majority of the time he teaches at um the boulder college there yeah it's uh it's an amazing place if you guys haven't visited i highly recommend it yeah, yeah. i well we'll be in telluride for mountain film festival um oh. in may wow telluride's an amazing place yeah we i try to go every year it's um a film festival of just documentaries and this year it's um the topic is young visionaries last year was equity oh wow young yeah visionaries. that sounds when is that uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. Um, if you'd like to go, um, let me know and um, we can most likely get you a pass. 
Cool. Yeah. Send me a link. Send send a link and the information to Marla. Okay. And then uh, schedule part two. And yeah. uh, I'll check it out and see if it works for our calendar. I love Telluride, that area. Yeah. My dad lives in Durango, so I got. Oh yeah. Oh, that's that's where we fly into. <laughs> yeah. It's just both of those are really cool areas. Yeah. So cool. And, the film uh, festival itself is is pretty incredible. Yeah, you're in the middle of a postcard with people <laughs> who care about issues like right. equity, and <laughs> so yeah, it's and speaking about young visionaries. Right. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm a yes. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay. I'll send all that to Marla. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Dan. And like I said, you are, your work is so well thought out and I don't know, you know, if it's the plant medicine or the <laughs> studying you've done or all the things combined, but you are being such a light to our lives and our listeners' lives. So thank you for taking the time with us. Mm, yeah. yeah. Thank you both for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you. I look forward Talk to, to you our again. Conversation. Yeah. Bye. Awesome. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.